I'm going to read six verses from probably one of the uh, most well-known or well maybe maybe most read uh, scriptures from the book of Isaiah that has to do with the death of Christ. How many of you have already guessed it? <laughs> Isaiah 53. And uh, I want you to uh, listen to these words. And then I have just a, I have not quite 10 points, uh, 10, 10 in, what did you call them, invaluable uh, concepts or invaluable thoughts. Uh, I don't have that. You, you didn't have anybody faint on you this morning, but when I say that, they, uh, they, they will. No. Actually, uh, this is off the subject, but actually my, my people are very, very gracious to me. And uh, if I say anything about the clock, I usually get reprimanded by somebody after the service saying, don't worry about the clock. <laughs> okay. But I do, I do something. I have no idea whether this clock is even right, so we won't worry about this one either. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1, Who has believed what he has heard from us? We're used to the King James, who has believed our report. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. And he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one. I, I like how, how that uh, this phrase is uh, grammatically put in the uh, ESV, we have turned, and then this big long dash, and then it says every one, and then another big long dash, mm. as if to emphasize all of us, mm. not just the bad people, in our opinion, but we have turned every one to his own way, mm. and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did you choose Jesus? Or perhaps another way to ask that question, why choose Jesus? <clears throat> we are attracted to attractive people, aren't we? That's why we're all here today. Because everybody else besides you is attractive, right? And we're attracted to attractive people. Whether it's physical looks or a pleasing personality or intellectual or mental brilliance or capability. That's why my wife married me. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> it's not. My hair used to be wavy. She just forgot that I was going to get older and it was going to get flat and straight. No. I, I hope it was more than that. Maybe a certain skill set that somebody has or a strong work ethic or deep and genuine godliness, or perhaps a mixture of all of those aforementioned qualities, we each have an idea of what is attractive, and then we are drawn to those people. Very few people, hopefully none of us here who are or have been married, married solely based on physical attraction, mm. right? Right? At least this is my assumption, and I know you're not supposed to assume. Brother Walter and I had a discussion about that when he was here on Friday, and uh, he told me what his one of his Bible school professors told him about that word, uh, kind of 
professor. I did say Bible school professor, too. I recently heard a preacher say that when he was looking for a wife, he knew that he needed to seek for and surrender to God's guidance. Mm -hmm. But he was also sure that in doing so, that he, he just knew, and I, I don't know if this is something that is, is typical of the greater holiness movement or not. He just knew that if he did that, or when he did that, because he knew he needed to, that God was going to give him an ugly wife, and then he was going to send him off to Africa to be a missionary to Canada. <laughs> It wasn't me that said that. I just heard a preacher say that. We need to look no further than Hollywood to see how quickly a relationship starts and then dissolves when physical characteristics are the primary basis for a relationship. And you and I know this, and, and uh, you know, so, but I'll just tell you this anyway. Attraction, what is attractive to each of us is subjective or relative, isn't it? As it's been said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. What you find attractive may be unattractive to me, or even repulsive. And the same may be for you about what I find attractive. We all have different things that either get our attraction motors revved up, or make them sputter and shut down. This applies to people, it applies to animals, nature, etc. If I had pictures up here and I had a picture of a, a pig all muddy because that's what they do and then a horse that uh, had been combed and is curried part of what is mm -hmm. that what they do? I don't know. I'm not much of a horse person. Um, I'm scared of horses actually because they're bigger than I am and, and I just you know it just scares me but uh, let's say I had a picture of a beautiful horse, all already, you know, the hair, the, the tail's combed out, and the mane is combed out, and, you know, they just, their, their coat is shiny, and, and I had these two pictures, which, which would be attractive? <laughs> See, there's always somebody that ruins my illustration. Thank you. <laughs> because what I was going to say is horses don't produce bacon. <laughs> Ralph, I'll have to talk to you after this. <laughs> but based on what we read in verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah 53 about the Messiah, Jesus, the one who was prophesied about in these verses, why would you choose Jesus? Why would you choose to follow somebody who is, he has no form or majesty that we should look at him? Has no beauty that we should desire him? He was despised. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief and as one who men, you know, whom men hide their faces from, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Paint a picture of that. Paint a picture of those two verses, and I guarantee you that people are going to look at look at that thing and say, "I'm not buying it." You can hang it on your wall if you want to, but I'm not. I'm not attracted. Now, the, the Bible doesn't say this in so many words, but I believe it's true. Jesus was a normal, typical, perhaps even unimpressive Jewish man, as far as the human was concerned. These verses give to us a visual image of a person whom any loving parent would have warned their children to avoid that person at all costs. If you see him coming, Go the other way. He was a despised individual. 
You say, well, yeah, preacher, but he was despised because of who he was and what he preached and what he taught and the things that he did. In Hebrew, despise, the word despise means contemptible, a vile person, one to scorn, one who was grossly underestimated and, and not appreciated at all. Isaiah said he was rejected by men. Are you attracted to people who are rejected by the majority? Now we should be, and I know that you know we're all Christians here this afternoon, so we're going to say, yeah, we're we're supposed to help the one that's rejected, or you know, be their friend. More people hated him. More people dismissed him as a lunatic or a false prophet, or just didn't care for him or care for his message. Then there were the, those that loved him and accepted him and followed him. He was rejected. He was a man of sorrows. One who bore much pain. Have you ever, as you've read through the Gospels and kind of followed the life of Christ, especially after he emerged as a, as a teacher and preacher in, in the land of Israel and and all of the things that happened to him that were negative. Mm. And thought, boy, that's the guy I would have followed. <laughs> he dealt with a lot of pain. The pain of hardship, misunderstanding, ridicule, hatred, loss during his time on earth. And he was acquainted with grief or sickness of every kind. COVID has kind of changed our world. Maybe, maybe some of a lot of it has worn off, but how many of you remember when COVID first came bursting on the scene and, and uh, if you were standing in line at a grocery store and somebody coughed, what happened? <laughs> you were immediately next in line because everybody else scattered. Why? They didn't want to be around somebody who might have whatever. Most of the people who flocked to him came because, why? Because they were physically, mentally, and spiritually sick. Amen. He was constantly surrounded by infirm people, healing deadly diseases, and dealing with some of the most despicable and detestable outcasts in society. See anything attractive yet? You ready to follow Jesus? I know you're following him. Most people would look the other way, maybe avoid eye contact, cross the street, or hide their faces from him. In spite of all the burdens and afflictions and issues that he bore, that were all ours, by the way, we joined the crowd, in a sense, and we cried, crucify him. Even his father doesn't want anything to do with him. Get rid of him. But we also have four reasons in verse 5 that make this one who seemingly is the most unattractive person ever to walk the face of the earth, that makes him the most attractive person who ever walked on the face of the earth. Let me give those to you real quick. First, Jesus accepted, willingly accepted our punishment. It should have been me who wore the crown of thorns, mm -hmm. not him. I was the one who should have been spit on and dishonored and degraded by horrible insults and false accusations and abusive treatment. That should have been me. He was innocent. He was pure. He was holy. He was God. It should have been me who received the lashes on my back. I should be the one who gets by the grace of God to heaven and have all the scars, not him. It should have been me who was nailed to the cross. It should have been me who had the spear put into my side. And all I can, all I can say when I think about that is just what unconditional beautiful, unfathomable love. Mm -hmm. 
that God would love a sinner such as I, would yearn to call me his own and call me to himself as we, we heard this morning so eloquently. And, and uh, Pastor Matt, thank you so much for that message this morning. That was, mm -hmm. that was just powerful. It was wonderful. God loves us. Mm. He accepted my punishment. He also paid my price. <laughs> What's the penalty for sin? If Noah was here, I, I would quiz him on, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a, a New York State policeman, for those of you that don't know, and uh, he does roam these areas, so uh, just be careful. <laughs> he'd, he'd be very kind to you, I'm sure. But if he was here, I'd say, okay, so no, if I do this, what's the penalty? If I do this, what's the, what's the, you know, what's my fine or whatever? The penalty for sin, according to Scripture, is death. Mm -hmm. But according to Scripture, the penalty for sin is also paid for by the one who commits the sin. That's me. Jesus never committed a single sin. I, I cannot, I, I believe it with all my heart. I know it's true. But because I'm human and because I'm surrounded by a human being, I can't imagine that. He never spoke an untrue, unkind word. All of you that are moms, you'd have loved to have a child like Jesus. You say, oh, come on, Pastor, he was a normal, average child. Oh, no, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He was the son of God. Mm -hmm. What a difference. He never acted in a way that was against God's will or his word. <clears throat> Committed no sins in his inner desires, thoughts, motives, or intentions. But he's the one who died. He's the one who paid the price. Mm -hmm. for my sins that's outrageous mercy third Jesus pain bought our peace apart from Jesus apart from his forgiveness his compassion his love I have no right to expect or have any kind of reconciliation and peace with God I am separated from God in my sinfulness. I have no right to expect God to accept me, except Jesus. His pain bought peace with God for me mm -hmm. and for you. I can't have peace with God, and I can't have the peace of God in my life apart from Christ. And yet, in spite of the sinful life I lived, when I came in humility and brokenness to Christ and repented and asked for forgiveness, what do I get? I didn't get a scolding. I didn't get pushed away and said, no, there's somebody better than you in line that I need to deal with first. He simply said, you're forgiven. Here's my peace. Amen. I bought your peace through my pain. Amen. And Jesus' poverty produced our prosperity. I like what 2 Corinthians chapter 8, or I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 8 and verse 9. Let me turn to it real quick. I, I love what this verse says. And you're probably, you probably have it memorized. You're, you're, Three steps ahead of the preacher here. But here's, here's, listen to these words. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. <laughs> Think about that. Jesus' poverty, Jesus' willingness to give up everything and let go of everything and become my sacrifice for my sins produces poverty in my life, prosperity in my life. 
Nothing describes prosperity like forgiveness and cleansing through Christ. Many people count prosperity in dollars and cents or earthly possessions or status in society or perhaps, uh, perhaps a list of per personal accomplishments. But in Scripture, prosperity is not based on what I have physically or materially or my, even my physical wellness or wholeness or my intellectual prowess, but it's based on who I know. To be freed and to be cleansed of the deadly disease of sin, gifted with eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, is genuine prosperity. I was talking to a gentleman that was here in the service last night, a man that comes to our church on Sunday nights, most, uh, most Sunday nights, and uh, he, was, he was talking about that. He said, he said you know, he said, uh, the poorest person on earth mm. is going to be the richest person in heaven. Mm -hmm. Our prosperity comes through Christ, through his death. This is real life. This is worthwhile life. Mm. A whole life. Life as God meant it to be for us. He gave himself for us. He took my place. I've, I've thought about Barabbas, and I, I have, you know, the scripture doesn't tell us anything, and, and thank you, Pastor Ellison, for uh, giving us the license to imagine what the scripture doesn't tell us. I, I know that's not what you meant, but I'm going to take it that way anyway. How's that? But, you know, it doesn't tell us what Barabbas thought when the jailer came to him and said, Barabbas, you're free to go. Because there's this man named Jesus, mm. he took your place. Mm. Barabbas was a murderer. Mm. He was a bad guy. He deserved to die. He deserved to be the one on that cross. I, I, hope, that, I hope that I see Barabbas in heaven, actually. By the grace of God, if I make it as I make it there, what a story he'd have to tell me. But you know, I left that jail and I thought, wow, why would somebody take my place? Mm. Why would somebody let me go free when I know I'm guilty? And yet for every one of us, whether we have done any great crimes or not, because of my sins, yeah. I deserve to die and yet Jesus took my place. Hallelujah. And it goes along with that song that Mike and Hannah just sang. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Mm -hmm. The blood that's been applied to my life. Mm -hmm. Not because I deserved it, but because God loved me. Mm -hmm. He gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. Let's pray, and then I've, I've asked uh, Pastor Sean.